to Scaling the Sound Wall. Um, my name is Esther Moreau, and I am from Brainspring here in snowy Michigan. Believe it or not, it snowed last night. Um, so we are not happy about that. However, we are happy to be here today with you. Um, Today's presentation is going to last about 45 minutes or so, and we'll have about 15 minutes at the end to answer any questions that you have. So as you think of questions, you can go ahead and post them in the Q&A, um, and then uh, at the end, we'll relay those questions to Sam, and, and she'll respond to those questions. Um, so Sam, I'd like to introduce Sam Brooks. Uh, she is one of BrainSpring's master instructors. And Sam instructs teachers all across the United States in structured literacy. Um, and she was instrumental in developing BrainSpring Soundwall. And so she's the perfect person to be here to share her expertise with you. So I'm gonna go ahead and let, let Sam take it away. And at the end, we'll, we'll come back for some questions. Go ahead, Sam. All right. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Scaling the Sound Wall. My, like Esther said, I'm Sam Brooks. I'm one of the master instructors here at BrainSpring. And, you know, this uh, idea of a sound wall is kind of sweeping the nation. Everywhere I go to train, it's the topic always comes up. And um, I've had many conversations with not only my colleagues, but educators across the country about sound walls. And it's not uncommon to hear things like, you know, I love the idea of a sound wall and I agree that it's probably a useful classroom tool. But since I was never taught as a beginning reader or as a beginning teacher in my college classes about the individual sounds in our English language, I'm just not confident about how to use the sound wall in my classroom or the best way to teach this to my students. And so if you too feel this way, even on some level, hopefully today we can just shed a light on what a sound wall is and how it can help you in, or how it can help your students become much better readers and writers. Okay, so some of the things, the purpose of the webinar we're doing today is just a general overview to share some general information about sound walls and to give suggestions on how to incorporate the sound wall into your daily instruction. And so here's some topics that we'll be scaling. We're gonna talk about, of course, the background and connection of science of reading. It's very important that you relate things to the science of reading to um, make sure that you're promoting best practices out there and that everything is very research-based. And, worth, and worthwhile doing. We're gonna talk about what sound walls are. We're gonna take kind of a close look at the consonant wall in the Vallow Valley. And we're gonna talk about how to use the sound wall in my instruction. Esther and I will do a demonstration of that for each um, a consonant and a vowel and some application. And then at the end, we'll show some extra resources if you wanted to deepen your understanding of sound walls and how, um, how they operate. Okay, so if you take a look at this sound wall, at first glance, it may look a um, like an unusual display of the alphabet. That's generally the first impression that people have. The letters are out of order. They're displayed on two different charts with pictures and different lists of other letters around them. It just seems a little bit chaotic if you're not familiar with the rationale regarding this type of display. So we're going to unravel that today. And so what are sound walls? Well, sound walls are valuable instructional tools that display the 44 phoneme sounds in our English language. And they're organized by the articulatory features, where and how the sounds are made. So if you just take a look at this uh, chart, you'll see that um, they're organized by categorizing and arranging the phonemes by their art what I said before, the articulatory features. And that's just a fancy way of saying what we use to articulate each sound. What our tongue does, our teeth, our lips, our facial muscles as the sound's being produced. Also, we talk about the manner or articulatory mechanisms we use to produce sounds, what we do with our airflow, what we do with our voice when we make the sounds. And so sound walls do go hand in hand with structured literacy. 
That includes explicit instruction for decoding, blending, and segmenting of phonemes to read, and also using sound spelling correspondences to be able to spell words. And this supports the development of that orthographic mapping process that enables students to become very fluent readers by connecting the sounds of the words they already know to the letters in a word that they see on the page. And then storing that in their that connection in their brains as instantly recognizable words. And that's the whole goal of reading instruction. We want students to be able to open a book and instantly recognize those words, effortless decoding so you can adhere to comprehension. And so we're gonna take a, just a journey back through the underpinnings of this. And have you ever noticed that when babies um, watch your mouth, as they watch your mouth, as you intently, very intently, as, you, as you're talking to them. And so they attempt to copy your mouth movements as they try to say words. This is how they learn to speak. And so their brains are very hardwired for speech at birth. So it's not something that has to be learned. It's very hardwired into our brain as far as our systems are concerned. But all those human speech developed around 100,000 years ago, humans didn't invent writing until about five or 10,000 years ago. Learning to read and write must be taught and does not come naturally. So it is not higher hardwired into our brain already. In her book, Speech to Print, Language Essentials for Teachers, Louisa Motes explains this, that our brains are not yet fully evolved for processing written language, meaning just because you can speak does not mean you can read and write. There needs to be some kind of instruction taking place. And so to better understand our, the sound wall, we kind of have to understand some things about our language system and how, it, um, and how it's made up. And so our language is compromised of individual speech sounds that we call phonemes. And when we talk, we co-articulate or these sounds, we push them together to make words that are recognizable to us. We must have the understanding of individual speech sounds that make up the words that we're saying, not only to pronounce them correctly, but also to learn to read and write. And so our language system has, is made up of 44 phonemes in the English language. There's 20, we are an alphabetic language. And so there's 26 letters in our alphabet that represent those 44 phonemes. And then you have over 200 letter combinations or graphemes that represent part of those 44 home phonemes. So we call English a very opaque language because it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. There's a mix, mix match already. We have 44 sounds and 26 letters. And so this includes that we also have 18 different individual sounds as vowels in our language, which makes things even more complicated because in order to spell all of our vowel sounds, we have multiple ways or grapheme graphemes to spell our vowel sounds. And so it can get pretty complicated. Well, the purpose of a um, sound wall is to understand how students perceive sounds. They, they recognize sounds from birth because as they enter school, they've been talking. So they have some knowledge of sounds, but they perceive their sounds speech to print by how the sound feels in their mouth, the way the air flows, their voicing, how their mouth looks when, they, when the sound is being made. That's how they distinguish one sound from the other. And so the purpose of a sound wall is to provide students with this concrete awareness of how to connect our speech sounds and how they are represented in print. All righty. So to understand the speech to print perspective that we all as teachers need to have of students, we have in order to teach them and make those connections strong, we have to understand how we use our facial muscles to orally produce the sounds in our language. And so 
when we do this, when we think, we must think of this perspective in terms of, like I said before, articulatory features. I know that's kind of a big word, but it means the shape of the mouth when the sound's being produced, the placement of the tongue, teeth, or lips when the sound is being produced. We also think in terms of the manner or how, and that has to do with um, our airflow, what's happening to our airflow? Is it coming out of your mouth or is it coming out of your nose? All of this is part of that perspective that students are in. And so is my voice on or is it off when I make this sound? And our consonant, what's important to also understand is our, the differences in a vowel and a consonant as it relates to sound. So our consonant sounds can be voiced or unvoiced and the airflow is always obstructed in some way, either by the teeth, lips, or the tongue. In contrast, our vowels are all voiced and the airflow is just all over the mouth. Vowels are felt by the lowering or open, closing or opening of the jaw when we say the sounds. And so those are two distinct ways that kids can understand the difference in those consonants and vowel sounds all related to those articulatory features and the manner in which we produce the sounds. And so Brain Spring sound wall posters are based on the science of reading and the research of Mary Dahlgren, a leading expert on sound walls for the classroom. We have organized the Brain Spring posters to provide a very broad representation of sounds to make them more accessible for students to understand and apply for reading and spelling. The BrainSpring sound wall is for general use by teachers in the classroom rather than a therapeutic use at the deepest linguistic level. So there are, you know, there are several common layout variations of sound walls as you see different ones when organizing our sounds. But however, the same standard feature does occur in each version. So occasionally additional labels may also be added and you can adjust this as needed to meet either your local instructional guidelines or your own understanding of our language. So what does the sound wall look like? Well, this on the screen is just an example of what our sound wall is. And the connection of speech sounds to the letters that make these sounds is an absolute necessity for students to learn to read and write. To put it simple, we just wanna help students match the sounds they're learning with all the ways that that sound is spelled so they can recognize it in print. A sound wall provides a visual representation again of the 44 phonemes in our English language. Sounds are grouped together and displayed on the chart according to their articulation. For each sound, there's a keyword picture, keyword that, is, that um, acts as a pictorial anchor, so to speak. We refer to them as keywords in phonics first instructions. And it, this serves as that, that temporary hold until those sound to letter connections are solidified. Additional spellings that represent the sounds are listed in order around the picture from the most commonly used. And that is a very nice way that, <clears throat> that kids can understand and connect all those spellings to the sounds of our language. And so another way to even deepen your understanding anymore is why don't we compare sound walls to something we're more familiar with, and that's a word wall. So if you look at the difference between sound walls and word walls, word, traditional word walls do focus on print to speech, meaning that a student must already know something about how the word is spelled to locate it on the word wall. Typically, traditional word walls are organized in ABC order, and the words are listed under the first letter of the spelling of the word. For example, if you needed to find the word the, the word the is typically list, put under the letter T in the alphabet on the, on the word wall. And so a word wall functions from the teacher's perspective of supporting the correct spelling of frequently used words. Also, this type of organization does restrict the number of words that could be displayed, which limits the effectiveness of the word wall as a classroom tool for students to use. And since this tool reinforces print to speech, kids really don't really know how to use it properly. And it becomes more of a sense of glorified wallpaper as there's not a lot of the kids that are able to use the word wall. 
In contrast, a sound wall focuses on the speech to print connection, meaning that if students can identify sounds in a word, then they can more easily locate the sounds in a word on the sound wall and then attach those letters or letter combinations. All of the 44 um, phonemes in English are represented. Consonant sounds are separated from vowel sounds, which aids in spelling of any phonetic English word that they're looking for. So sound walls function from a student's perspective, speech to print, rather than from a teacher's perspective. Moving to, um, and this really does help move them, their known sounds to the spelling of multitudes of words, whichever words that they find that they may need. And so let's just take a closer look at the consonant. We'll start with the consonant wall. So it's important that we understand how students are perceiving the sounds that are coming out of your mouth as you're modeling the sounds and out of their mouth as they're saying the sounds. And when we think about consonants, we mostly pay attention to what happens with our airflow and our voice when we're making these sounds. So with our consonants, we categorize these according to airflow. Is the air free flowing or is it blocked? And to describe this in kid-friendly terms, we call these stops and continuance. We label them like that. And so stop sounds do just that. The sounds, when it comes out of your mouth, the sound just stops like boom. And then continuance, you can hold that sound out until your breath runs out like So let's do an activity. So I'm just gonna trust that you guys might just be doing this. So get out a sheet of paper. And what I want you to do is I want you to make a T-chart, put stops on one side and continuance on the other. I'll give you a second. All right, so this is what I want you to do. Go through all the consonants in the alphabet and see if you can list what's a stop sound and what's a continuance sound. We'll do the first two together. So the first sound is B. Did my airflow stop or did it continue? Okay. So did you get it right? My students go, yes, <laughs> when that happens. Yes, B is a stop sound. So let's do another one. Listen to the sound. Did my airflow stop or did it continue? Listen again. Yes, did you get it right? Great job. Now, sometimes if kids are having some difficulty with stops and continuance, I'll just have them hold their hand pretty close to their mouth as they're saying the sounds. If air hits their hand, it's a continuant. If it doesn't, it's a stop. Okay, so this is what I want you to take one minute and I'm gonna time you because we don't have a lot of time, but one minute and I want you to go through the other letters of the alphabet and I want you to label them. Say the sounds, put stops under stops and continuance under continuance. So I'll give you one minute. Okay, we have about 20 seconds. Okay, hopefully you had enough time to at least get most of the letters categorized, but there they are. 
So check yours. Did you get it right? Well, great. I'm going to just assume you did. <laughs> You did. All right. So stops and continuance, those labels refer to airflow. Does the air stop or continue when the consonant sound is produced? Okay. So there's another thing we need to think about with our consonants. So when we say a consonant sound, we also notice what's happening with our voice. And so this is called voice to run voice. So consonant sounds are either stops or continuance with airflow or they are voiced or unvoiced, meaning when the sounds produced, the voice is on or off. And so what I want you to do is I want you to go through the, the stops and continuance column on your paper. And I want you to do this with me. We're gonna do the first two together. And so what I want you to do is I want you to rest your two fingers right above your larynx, right there. And I have to tell my students, don't push on it because it'll hurt. So just let us rest, rest it right here and do this with me. So I want you to say this sound. Did you feel vibration or shaking? Was your voice turned on or off? Listen again. Correct is an unvoiced sound. And so now rest your fingers on your larynx again and say this sound, g, g. Did you feel shaking? Was your voice turned on or off? Listen, g. Yes, g is a voiced sound. And so some kids have a lot of trouble with voiced and unvoiced. They're just not sure what they're feeling or if they've even got their fingers in the right place. Sometimes my kids are down here. So an easier way for kids that need a little bit more support hearing voiced or unvoiced, you can have them cup their ears and say the sound. So try that, cup your ears and say, g, g. What happens is they'll notice their, um, they can hear vibration and resonance a lot better. And so that might be a, a strategy you can do for some kids that have a little bit more trouble. Now see if you can tell if each consonant that you have written on your paper is voiced or unvoiced. Say them aloud as you go through each one and then circle the consonants that are voiced and then underline the consonants that are unvoiced. So we'll do a couple together just to make sure that you're on the right start. So the first one I'm gonna do is B. So I'm gonna put my hand here, B. Did you feel shaking? B. Did you hear sound? Yes, so b is going to be a voiced sound. So try it again. Do this. Did you feel shaking? Did you hear your voice? So is an unvoiced sound. So go through the rest of them. Just take a minute and go through the rest of them just like that. All right, I'll reveal the answers. There you go, how'd you do? Hopefully it was, yes. <laughs> All right, so consonant sounds are voiced and unvoiced as well as stopping continuance. It all has to do with that airflow and that voicing that turns your voice on and off when the sound's being made. Okay, so on our, let's go back to the sound walks. There's a couple of, I wanna talk about that consonant chart and talk about the categories that we have displayed on the chart. So we do have the continuance and on the consonant wall, these sounds are arranged into five categories on our chart. 
of what we call airflow mechanisms. They're, the labels describe how the air pushes from the mouth as the sounds are being produced. And we also have an icon there, if you notice the megaphone that's underneath the columns, that's gonna signal if the, your voice is on or off. And so the consonant chart lists these categories in rows under their label. And so if you can notice that the stops are all in the dark green version, okay, that's just going to be that short burst of air. That short burst of air, that's going to be their, their, key, their cue to be able to recognize those. Then you have the stop voiced ones, b, d, g, j, so you can hear my voice turn on. And so those are gonna be your stops. And then you have, again, the next column we're gonna talk about is your continuance. So these are the one where the voice flow just keeps going till you run out of breath. And so um, uh, these are your, going to be your continuance and you're gonna have those listed right there. Again, recognize that you have unvoiced in one column and voiced in the other under the continuance label. All right, and also, if you can notice, if you see it on the screen, if you look right by continuance, you'll see a little picture. See that little icon? That's going to cue kids as a pictorial aid to show that that's going to be a continuance sound. Shh, or the, when the airflow is just constantly coming out of the mouth. Okay. All right, so then besides stops and continuance, there are going to be some consonant sounds that can be described further with more specific airflow categories. And that's what we have noted on the chart. So let me go over those consonants. So we have this um, consonant grouping called the nasals. And nasals, when, you're air, when you say the sound, the airflow comes through your nose when the sound is produced. That means there's something blocking either your tongue, teeth, or lips that are blocking the airflow from coming out of your mouth. So, for example, the, the first one is the mmm. Obviously, when you make the mmm sound, your, your lips block the air from coming out of your mouth. And so you'll have the, just that category of nasals. What's important to understand about nasals is they present problems. Those sounds will present problems when they come after vowels and or before vowels in words, like long and long. They're really welded. So it's very hard for kids to hear the individual sounds in those words where you have a nasal sound. The vowel sound's gonna be harder to hear. And so the spelling of the word's gonna be harder for them too. So it's interesting or it's important that when you're teaching these sounds that you kind of understand that they are gonna be harder for them to hear when they get to that inward, within word stage rather than just in isolation. All right, so let's see, see the other specialty ones. These are called the glides. And so your glides, there's no friction in the airflow, but there are changes in the sound produced by the placement of your tongue or lips when these sounds are produced. Sounds may seem very hard to separate within word because they just glide into the other letter or the other sounds in the word. And so that's gonna be very hard for them to separate and hear individual sounds within a word when they begin with a glide. And so then you have your other set and that's gonna be your liquids. And so the liquids are just the two on this side. I'll talk about the two sounds ones in just a minute. So your liquids are just sounds that are, the airflow just swirls all over your mouth. Your tongue creates this partial closer, closure in the mouth that redeflects the airflow but your airflow just kind of swirls everywhere. You know, we have bossy R sound. Well, there's really bossy L too. L is a, as problematic as R is. When you're talking about reading pronunciation of words and spelling words, when they have an L in there, it's just really hard for them. And that's all about those liquid um, sounds. And so if you look on the other side of the chart, it has a number two where it says two sounds. There's two letters of our alphabet that are represented by double or biphonemes. So the X is X, 
is K and S. And then you have the QU, which is Qu, and that's the K. And so we just put those in a column by them um, separately from the other consonants. Okay. So one more thing about the consonants before we do our demonstration is again, I want you to notice that megaphone icon used for the voice and unvoiced of each of the stops and continuance column. Well, the unvoiced, um, the way that the um, sounds are listed, they're listed beside what we call their unvoiced or their voiced pair or their voiced buddy. For example, if you look at and b. This is basically the only voicing sets apart these two sounds. When you when you're there, actually, you have the exact same mouth movement or position when the sound is made. The only difference is your voice is on for one of them and off for the other. And we have several several other buddies that are produced the same way. And so students very often confuse these sound pairs in their spelling of words. So when you see kids um, substituting sounds or reversing sounds, it'll usually be these buddy sounds. So if you look at all of these, you can definitely see some correlation in what they're perceiving. What's important to note that these are not, when a student writes the word, like they write the word pot as bot, they're not making a letter confusion error. They're making a sound confusion error. So typically what the teacher might do when she sees that is tell them that you should have a D here, not a T. But a, from the student's perspective, what might be better to say is that I, I understand why you did put that T right there. The last sound in the word red is D. And so you confuse the voice buddy, and then you can go up to the sound wall and show them and understand. I think if you bring it to their perspective, then you'll see a lot less of those reversals start happening or those um, confusions stop happening in the way that we tell them to the correct their errors. It's all gonna be based on sound. Okay, this is an important um, time just to mention that uh, and a, a reminder that on our members area, we do have this sounds index on our members area. I'm gonna tell you guys, I refer to the sound de index a lot. I love my Southern accent. I love that I have that little draw mixed in with a little Midwest and a little hillbilly too. But uh, when I started teaching phonics, I had to refer to the sounds index a lot because as a teacher, Precise sound production is an absolute must. And so I had to make sure that I was pronouncing my sounds clearly as I expected the students do. It has a direct correlation between their decoding and their encoding skills. And so I absolutely had to be precise. And so I just wanted to remind you that that sounds index has audio recordings of every sound that we teach in the program. And it's a very, very, and it goes beyond just layer one in consonant sounds, because then when you get like your R blends, I really had to listen to how those were pronounced so that I was saying them correctly because I didn't learn to read by isolating my sounds. So I never learned how to isolate those sounds when I was learning to read, but I did as a teacher of phonics. And so that's just something that's important to note. Okay, so. You know, sounds are ephemeral and they disappear as soon as they're spoken. So in order to concretize this, we must make sounds very understandable for kids by asking questions during our introduction that will cue their attention to the articulatory features of the sounds we are teaching so that they have a tool to use to go to when they need it. So when introducing a new sound to students, important questions pertaining to that sound's airflow and voicing should be attended to for kids to identify and to produce the sound correctly in isolation or also when it's embedded within a word. These questions help kids understand how to locate certain sounds on the sound wall because this is exactly how the sound wall is organized. So you're, during your introduction, you will ask kids questions 
saying the sound, is it blocking my airflow? Did my airflow stop or did it continue? Did my airflow go through my nose? Was my voice turned on or off? And so if you um, order the brain spring sound wall, what you'll get is you'll get this, this um, it's kind of like an introduction guide. And it's really great. It's an instructional guide for the teacher and it has these questions listed on there. So it definitely gives you a script or definite starting place on how to add this into your lessons. And so right now, Esther, are you still there? I am here. Okay. So Esther is <laughs> going to do me a favor, guys. What we're going to do is we're going to put this into practice. We're going to introduce a new consonant sound. So I'm going to be the teacher and she's going to be my student. You ready? Yep. Okay. All right. We're, we're going to learn a new sound today. So repeat after me. Pat. Pat. Pig. Pig. Pet. Pet. Pot. Pot. What sound did you hear that was the same in all of those words? I heard p. Very good. I did too. You are so smart. Let's practice that sound three times. Ready? Say it with me. P. Now I want you to look, watch my mouth as I say the sound. Ready? Watch. What did you see my sound doing? I saw your lips go together. And That's then I right. saw your lips pop open. That's right. My lips were together and then they popped open. And this is the time that I could give Esther or my student a mirror and have them watch their own mouth do it. Is the sound continuous or does it stop? So hold your hand right here and I want you to say it again. Ready? It stops. It stops. Very good. All right. Now I also want you to say the sound again and tell me, is your voice on or is it off when we say the sound? So let's hold our fingers right here and let's do the sound again. Ready? Is your voice I on? I think or it's off? off. That's right. So now we know that P is an unvoiced stop sound. And so now, is represented by the letter P. And the letter P says P, as in pizza. That's gonna be our keyword. So let's go over to the sound wall and find the sound P, P as in pizza on the sound wall. And so we would go over to the sound wall. And then I said, okay, recap P is an unvoiced stop sound. Can you find it on the sound wall? Mm -hmm. Yay, we found it right there. That's right. Very good. So that's just a simple example of how the sound wall can be incorporated into your introductions. And that did not take a lot of time at all. So this is so easily um, added in. Okay. Now here's some just reminders I want to just uh, go over with you real quick about the consonant wall before we jump to the vowel wall. So the consonant wall, in order to concrete, uh, make this very concrete for kids, we need to, to really um, make this very concrete to them, how, this is rep how these sounds are rep reckon, sorry, represented <laughs> in print. So kids will need these pictorial anchors, these stickers, and the ones on your sound wall, if they match, that's going to make a much stronger connection for them. So if you do use um, phonics first and or structures and you use these pictures using the sound wall that has our pictorial anchors on there are going to make that much stronger connection. Phonemes do have the keywords and to um, reference that chart and you're going to reference this uh, sound wall daily whenever any kind of any questions come up or the kids need any particular sound so you're going to refer to the sound wall several times daily there are some examples of how to do that in that instruction guide in the sound wall instruction guide so graphemes are displayed as phonics instruction begins and so it's very, um, it's recommended that spellings not taught yet are covered up and revealed as the patterns are taught. So I just want you to look at this real quick. 
So this is it. If I was teaching in layer one and I was teaching the sound J, then I would teach the sound, go to the sound wall, reveal the J on the J sound wall. And so now they have a representation of all of the sounds that they have learned. And so just that's going to um, lessen the confusion that the kids say see on the sound wall when they see those other groupings of letters if they're not familiar enough with them at this time. Okay, so now we're going to get to vowels. So I just I thought this cartoon was just funny, so I just put it in there real quick. A E I O U. <laughs> okay, so now let's switch off to vowels. And so the definition of a vowel, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, is a speech sound that's made with your mouth open, your tongue in the middle of your mouth, not touching your teeth or your lips. Basically, a vowel sound is produced when there's no obstruction in the air coming out of your voice box. Instead, the air is obstructed by your teeth, lips, or tongues. That's a consonant sound. So that's going to be a varying difference between vowels and consonants. When your airflow is restricted by your teeth, lips, or tongue, that's a consonant sound. But vowels just come from the back of your throat with no obstruction. And so since all vowel sounds are voiced and the airflow is continuant, all of them are voiced, all the airflow is continuant all over the mouth, there's no exact point of reference. And there's little variance in exactly where the mouth, the sounds are coming from which makes them very difficult to distinguish. And the sounds just seamlessly melt into the consonant sounds around them in words, making them very difficult to isolate. And so when we learn vowel sounds, careful attention must be made to the placement of our tongue as we open and close our jaw and round our lips. That's gonna be how they're gonna feel the vowel, chart, the vowel sounds. And so the vowel valley represents this student perspective of valley sounds. So there are 18 vowel sounds in our language. Again, there are five vowel letters in our alphabet. Like I said before, this mismatch just unfortunately creates chaos of having to actually learn multiple ways to spell our vowel sounds. So every vowel sound is, like I said, voiced or continuant. And these 18 vowel sounds are represented and organized in a V design on the chart. We call this the vowel valley. And the reason is, is because it's all about how the students are perceiving these vowel sounds. This chart is labeled by the mouth position. And if you look right up there on the chart, I know I'm touching it like you can see it, sorry. You look right up here at the chart at the mouth pictures. So the mouth position of the chart, we begin at the top left with the E, you have a tight smile, close your, your teeth come close together, but they don't touch. E, the airflow is flowing all over your mouth when that sound is made. And as you go down the chart, your jaw opens to the most open position. Oh, and then going back up a chart, up the chart again, your lips actually start to round as you're pronouncing those vowel sounds going up and your jaw starts to close again with the U, the tight rounded sound at the top. Ooh. Now bossy R is located at the bottom and the diphthongs are at the lower right. So I'm gonna try to say these, like sometimes when I'm saying fast, I get them mixed up. So forgive me if I goof, but I'm really gonna try. I'm gonna start at that top left corner. E, I want you to watch my, my jaw as I say the sounds going down the chart. E, I, A, E, A, I, A. Did you see how my jaw just dropped in little gradients? Also, guys, what I figured out when I've been doing vowel intensives, you know, you do the vowel intensives for your lesson. The sounds that kid, the vowels that kids get mostly confused are the ones that are closest together on your vowel valley. So I'm doing a lot, I mean a lot of, of sounds that are, that are on that vowel valley because there's not a lot of difference in the drop of the jaw. And so just wanted to kind of just throw that out there. Now, as you're going up the right side of the chart, what happens to your mouth, it's in this ah 
up position. And as you say those sounds, your lips start to round as you go up to the top. So just watch my mouth for me. Ah, uh, ah, oh, uh, you, ooh. So you can definitely see, I know I did that pretty fast, but you can definitely see the differences in how your jaw drops and your lips round. That's gonna be how they're gonna recognize their vowel sounds and how they're perceiving them. All right, so Esther, are you still there? I'm here. All right. Well, today, Esther, we're gonna be learning about the short O sound, aw. Oh. All right, so here we go. Repeat after me, mom. Mom. Dog. Dog. Cut. Cut. What sound did you hear that's the same in all of those words? I heard ah. Very good. Let's practice that sound three times. Ready? Ah. 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 Oh, very good. What does my mouth like look like when I'm saying the sound? Watch me. Ready? I'm going to open my mouth really wide and my tongue is down and my lips are rounded. So watch this. Oh, what do you see? Uh, I see your mouth open wide like a big circle. That's right. We call that the doctor sound. You know, when you go to the doctor and he has that little stick and he wants to look in your throat and he says, open up and say, Oh, uh, but in so Michigan, we say, ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the position of your mouth, you have to open really, really wide when you say these sounds. So this is the time you can give kids a small mirror and they can look at their own mouth, making the sounds relating to, yes, my mouth is open really wide and my tongue is down. So now the sound. Now also. Where's my jaw again while I'm saying the sound? Oh, it's open all the way. That's right, it's open all the way. So the ah sound is spelled with an O. O says ah as an octopus. And so, I'm sorry, I didn't advance this guys, I'm sorry. All right, so let's go found, find this sound on our vowel valley. And so what we're gonna do is go up to the vowel valley and then I'm going to say, can you find our new sound on the wall? Look at the mouth positions. Can you find it? Remember, our mouths are open really, really wide. Can you find it? Mm -hmm. Oh, and have them do it again if they need to um, relate that. And then what you're going to say is that there it is right there. Our jaws open really, really wide. Very good. Okay. So, oh my gosh, how fast an hour goes, right? Well, using the sound wall in your phonics lesson. So if you're using structures in phonics first, this sound wall piece can easily be put in in the multi-sensory introduction right there as you are, um, right after the new sound is introduced and the graphing card is shown, you can go through all the sound wall steps that are listed on that instruction guide. Adding this introduction really helps to secure that phoneme graphing connection. Okay, so just a few reminders about using the vowel valley. So the graphemes are listed by the keyword picture in order of sequence of the phonics first lessons or structures. And they're the, usually the graphemes are listed in order of the most common um, graphemes for those sounds that we're teaching. You refer to the sound wall during any decoding or encoding opportunities throughout your instructional day. And this will help the kids become more and more familiar with how and when they should refer to the sound wall for help. It has to make sense to them for them to use it or they're simply not gonna use it. So making things very concrete and understandable is your best way to go. It really helps to cover the graphemes not yet taught. So uncovering them as lessons are taught prevents a lot of confusion with students as they are connecting those sounds with those graphemes, especially with vowels, because vowels have multiple ways to spell. And so at the beginning, if you're in layer three, that's when that's our big vowel layer when a lot of these graphemes are taught, especially for the long vowel sounds. And as you teach those, you can uncover them. So let's say that I just taught the graphing, the vowel team EE, -E, 
And then what I would do is after I did the introduction, I would uncover that on my sound wall. And it really does enhance its utility as a resource for reading and writing. Also, a good thing to note is the vowel valley, I'm telling you, and the consonant chart both are great graphing support for auditory drill practice while you're doing your auditory drill, especially when you get up to multiple spellings in layers two, three, and four. So example, say I was, um, I taught three ways to spell or five ways to spell A, and then they could go and they, if the sound wall is there, they can see the ways they've learned to spell A right there on the chart, and they can do them in that order to avoid confusion or miscues while they're trying so desperately to connect all those graphing supports and spellings for vowels. All right, so this is the poster set that we have here at Brainspring. I have some up on the wall. I don't know if you could see them. That's about how large they are. Some people like to cut them apart and put them in different in a different arrangement. And that's, of course, perfectly OK. It varies teacher to teacher how you want to do that. And it does come. Remember, it comes with this handy dandy instruction guide. Also, there are student sound walls in here, ones that they can actually fill out as they're learning, and then one you can put in their reference notebook for student or small group. So we got you covered on all of that too. All right, so Esther is just going to take a minute and she's going to talk to you about CEUs. Yeah, so if you are here um, watching this webinar and you are working toward BrainSpring certification, renewal, um, you are eligible for one CEU. Um, so there'll be a survey um, um, that you can take, um, a, a survey monkey quiz that you can take, and then uh, just take a, a photo of your results and send that in for renewal. So um, you'll be, um, you can, you can watch for a follow up email, and um, that information will be on there. Okay, well, thank you, Esther, so much for that. Yeah. All right, guys, here again is the Soundwall resources. And so if you want some deeper and <clears throat> more information about the Soundwalls and just to go dive deeper into it, because it, there are a lot of layers, just like an onion for sure. Um, here's just some helpful websites. The book Speech to Print, I just highly recommend that. I think in my beginning, as I was starting to understand from the Speech to Print perspective, that was a very big aid to me. It's just understanding language in that way. And so the, also the um, transitioning from word walls to sound walls, that's on reading rockets. That's a really good, very teacher friendly um, article that talks about that as well. There's lots of YouTube things on sound walls too. If you just wanna dive deeper into that methodology and way of teaching, okay? Otherwise than that, I'm gonna say, thank you. Yes, thank you, Sam. That was wonderful. Yes. Um, we do have about about seven minutes or eight minutes left, um, and okay. we have a few questions here. So I'm just going to read some questions to you, Sam, that came in right. on our uh, Q and A board. Um, on the sound wall poster, why are the nasals listed separately and not with the stops and continuance? It's just a way because the nasals have that, they're more specific in the way that I'm telling you, it all comes down to the airflow comes out of the nose versus the mouth. And we just want to call special attention to those three because they are problematic when students are reading. If they um, read a word and the, they're trying to decode it and they're isolating sounds first before they blend, they have trouble blending nasals. They also have trouble with spelling words with nasals in there. So we just wanna call um, more attention. It's not that they're not stops and continuants. It's just that that special, specialized way to uh, categorize them, to call that special attention to them. Okay, uh, another question. Can you repeat where to find the audio for the sounds on the members area page? 
Okay. So if you go and Esther, help me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yep. I can help you. Okay. So if you go to Brain Springs members area and you click Educator Academy and then go to uh, Phonics First Resources, I'm sure Structures is the same way. And you click on that and you're in the Phonics First Index and you scroll down. I'm telling you right underneath that thing that says, um, right underneath the instructions for navigating the indexes, you'll see sounds index and it's right there, all four layers right there. Yeah, so it's right on the members area, right when you enter the members area, it's right there. Um, okay, we have a, one more question. How about this one? Um, can I still use the BrainSpring sound wall if I don't use phonics first or structures? Sure, absolutely, sure. absolutely. You absolutely because sounds are sounds, right, Sam? Sounds are sounds. That's right. That's so it right. can be put into play. But you may, if you're wanting that, especially with your intervention groups, they are going. They're going to be the ones that rely on that those pictorial anchors most of all. So you might make yourself a little card deck with those pictures on it, but then use whatever phonics program you're using. But that's just going to be a way to connect those with stronger ways. But you can absolutely use this with anything. Excellent. Um, let's see. Uh, can we order more than one sound wall poster? Absolutely. You can order however <laughs> many you want. Many I love you to hear want. that. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. That's um, right. You just order yes. away. Awesome. Yes. Yes. And they're very, they don't take up too much space on your wall. That's no. what's nice about them. That they're, you know, one they're, of the things that teachers tell me also, they do appreciate that they don't come in hundreds of pieces. <laughs> they do yes. like that. And then you can cut them if you want to display some space between the columns or you want to display your vowel valley in a more multi-sensory way than right there on one chart. You can, of course, cut them to size. All right. All right. I think that's that's going to do it. I think okay. we've answered all the questions there. Um, anybody have any last minute questions? We have about two minutes left. So uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, I see there are questions there. This this will eventually um, be going on to um, you'll be able to access this video. Um, or, or this webinar on our YouTube channel. Um, give it a few days. It might not be up there immediately, but it will be on there. So if you um, want to re-watch re this or share it with somebody, absolutely, that's available for you. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Sam. Everybody, that was a thanks so really much. nice job. Um, we're going to go ahead and close the meeting. And uh, if anybody has any additional questions, you can contact Brainspring, um, and we will we will get those those answers out to you. So thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Sam.